Islam does an amazing job convincing its adherents that they're the purest of monotheists, even as they revel in paganism and idol worship. Over and over again, day after day, Muslims bow down to a giant cube in Mecca, a cube that was a pagan shrine during the time of Muhammad. Muslims take a pilgrimage to Mecca so that they can walk circles around this giant cube, and they push their way towards it so that they can kiss the black stone, a black stone that was a pagan idol during the time of Muhammad. There isn't a lifeless idol in the world that receives more attention and reverence than the lifeless idols of Islam. And yet Muslims believe that their religion is idol-free. Even more interesting is what happens when Muslims pray towards their lifeless cube. They pray to Muhammad. Now Muslims will erupt in protest here, but this only proves my point. They talk to Muhammad during their prayers and never bother to think about what they're saying. Let me explain. Most of the time when Muslims are praying, they're reciting words that are directed towards Allah. But there's a part of their prayers where they say, Assalamu alayka ayyuhan nabiyu. Here's an example from a Muslim video explaining how to perform salah, Islamic prayer and worship. Assalamu alayka ayyuhan nabiyu. Why is this important? Well, assalamu alayka ayyuhan nabiyu doesn't mean peace be upon the Prophet or God please send peace upon the Prophet. It means peace be upon you, O Prophet. So Muslims around the world are speaking directly to Muhammad during this portion of their prayers. In fact, here's another clip from a Muslim instructional video that includes the translation. Assalamu alayka ayyuhan nabiyu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sadly, Muslims don't see a problem here. We're just sending peace and blessings on the Prophet. But there's a world of difference between, on the one hand, Allah, please give peace to the Prophet, and on the other hand, peace be upon you, O Prophet. In the former, you're talking to Allah about Muhammad. In the latter, you're talking to Muhammad himself. If I say, God, please bless Grandma, I'm talking to God about my Grandma. But if I say, bless you, grandma, my grandma had better be in the room because I'm talking to her. So Muslims speak directly to Muhammad during their prayers. They therefore assume that Muhammad can hear them because it only makes sense to speak directly to Muhammad if he can hear what they're saying. But if Muslims around the world over and over again, day after day, talk to Muhammad during their prayers, what attribute would Muhammad need to have in order to hear them? omnipresence. And that's a divine attribute. So why would Muslims, who are supposed to be extremely careful about associating partners with Allah, talk to Muhammad during their prayers and ascribe a divine attribute to their prophet? They do it because Muhammad told them to. Sahih al-Bukhari, 831. Narrated Shakik bin Salama. Abdullah bin Masud said, Whenever we offered Salat, prayer behind the Prophet, we used to recite in sitting, As-Salam, peace be on Jibreel, Gabriel, Mikhail, Michael, peace be on so-and-so. Once Allah's Messenger, after finishing the Salat, prayer, looked back at us and said, Allah Himself is As-Salam, peace, and if any one of you prays, then he should say, At-Tahiyatu Lillahi wa Salawatu wa Tayyabatu, As-Salamu Alaika, Ayyuhan Nabiyu wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuhu. Assalamu alayna wa Allah ibadla is salahin. All the compliments, prayers, and good things are due to Allah. Peace be on you, O Prophet, and Allah's mercy and blessings be on you. Peace be on us and on the true pious slaves of Allah. If you say that, it will be for all the slaves in the heaven and the earth. Notice Muhammad proclaims, if any one of you prays, he should say, and then one of the things Muhammad commands Muslims to say is, Assalamu alayka ayyuhan nabiyu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Peace be on you, O Prophet, and Allah's mercy and blessings be on you. Muhammad commands Muslims to speak directly to him when they pray. Muhammad also told his followers to pray to him when they needed something. In Reliance of the Traveler, page 935, we read, 
Termidi relates, through his chain of narrators from Uthman ibn Hunayf, that a blind man came to the Prophet and said, I've been afflicted in my eyesight, so please pray to Allah for me. The Prophet said, Go make ablution, wudu, perform two rakahs of prayer, and then say, O Allah, I ask you and turn to you through my Prophet Muhammad, the Prophet of mercy. O Muhammad, speaking to Muhammad here, I seek your intercession with my Lord for the return of my eyesight. And in another version, for my need that it may be fulfilled. O Allah, grant him intercession for me. The Prophet added, and if there is some need, do the same. So a blind man comes to Muhammad and asks him for prayer, but Muhammad tells him to go pray, and Muhammad gives him the words to pray. What does Muhammad tell him to say in his prayer? O oh Allah, I ask you and turn to you through my prophet Muhammad, the prophet of mercy. O oh Muhammad, I seek your intercession with my Lord for the return of my eyesight. He was commanded to pray to both Allah and Muhammad. And Muhammad adds, and if there is some need, do the same. If you have some need, do the same. Do what? Pray to both Allah and Muhammad. What do Muslims do today? They pray to both Allah and Muhammad while condemning everyone else for idolatry and paganism. Let's think about this. According to Islam, the worst possible sin is shirk, either associating partners with Allah or ascribing divine attributes to something other than Allah. Muslims do both multiple times per day, and there are 1.6 billion Muslims in the world. This means that Islam is the greatest source of shirk, idolatry, and paganism in history. Other religions have been polytheistic, but they haven't been as successful as Islam. So, who's responsible for Islam being the greatest source of shirk, idolatry, and paganism in history? Muhammad. He's the one who told his followers to pray facing a pagan shrine, and to kiss a pagan idol, and to talk to him again and again during their daily prayers, and to ascribe to him the divine attribute of omnipresence. But this means that Muhammad is responsible for more shirk than any other man in history. Now, according to Islam, not according to Judaism or Christianity, according to Islam, what should be the punishment for history's greatest proponent of shirk and idolatry? Surah 27, verse 90. And whoever brings an evil deed, i.e. shirk, polytheism, disbelief in the oneness of Allah, and every evil sinful deed, they will be cast down, prone on their faces in the fire. And it will be said to them, Are you being recompensed for anything except what you used to do? As a general rule, if your prophet, according to your own book, is face down in hell, probably time for a new prophet. 